Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm glad you made it here. I know some of you are stuck behind traffic lights that are normally working. So good job for making, making it here. Um, you're at part three, or, or the third session of a four-part series on the Arab Spring. And we are starting on our website, well, actually on our, our Facebook site. So this is the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan Facebook site. You can either get into um, find the Facebook site by going to Facebook and just typing in the search for World Affairs Council of Western Michigan, or you can go to our website, um, worldmichigan.org, to link to the Facebook site. And we'd be very happy to have your comments about tonight's lecture, about the previous lectures, and, and for the final lecture as well. So this is our venture into social media and trying to make um, these sessions, which are very interactive, uh, especially with the half an hour question and answer time, even more interactive. So we'd love to hear your feedback. Maybe you have some further questions to pose. Um, anything you'd like to say, we'll, we'll look at it. Um, and, and maybe even take uh, an edited section and post it on our actual website. So we welcome your, your comments, both in the question and answer time and also on our, our Facebook um, site. Tonight, we're going to hear about how the Arab Spring has impacted U.S. foreign policy. And, <laughs> and, and our speaker is agreeing that is what he's talking about. That, sort, of, yeah. sort of. So he, he's going to nuance that title, which he already has here on, on, the, um, on, on the screen, as you, can, as you can read. So Dr. Roger Durham is a professor here at, a, at Aquinas College in the political science department. He's the chair of the political de <laughs> science department. He teaches the international relations and comparative politics courses and coordinates the international studies degree. He also is the advisor for the Model United Nations and Modern Arab League. Those are both student programs. So he works with students and in involving them in these very important topics. So we're going to turn it over to Roger for um, great enlightenment on this topic. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Amy. Oh, you don't have to clap yet. Wait till, I, wait till I'm done. You might not clap. <laughs> How's everybody doing? You know, last night was Halloween. I always have a great time at Halloween. And one of the things I like to do when kids knock is I knock back. <laughs> They're not sure what to do with that. Well, Arabs have been knocking back, haven't they? Arabs have been knocking back. And so tonight I'm going to uh, have a whole bunch of slides here. Um, we can talk about specific countries, but I think that's already happened in a couple of the presentations. I apologize that I haven't been to uh, all of them. Um, been very, very busy. But uh, for sure, we're going to talk about uh, sort of the origins of the Arab Spring. We're going to put it into some international relations context. We're going to talk about rentier states. And then we're going to talk specifically about Libya. I think Libya is a very important case here. And um, I, I teach at Aquinas, so I'm not Catholic. Nobody else has to say anything about the religious heritage, but uh, I do really appreciate our Dominican heritage. And we're going to talk about just war theory. We're going to talk about whether war is justifiable or not. So we have some handouts on that. So with that said, we're going to bank through uh, a number of slides, and then we'll have some time for question and answer. So we're talking about MENA, Middle East, North Africa. Um, this is the area uh, in color. Iran, of course, is not Arab. They are Farsi. They are Iranian. But generally, everybody else is considered Arabic in general, except, of course, Turkey. Uh, there's, there aren't common languages, but there are huge misperceptions, huge misperceptions among Americans and among decision makers that the Arab world is united. The Arab world is not united. The Arab world is not united on religious differences, on nationalistic differences, on economic development issues, issues certainly on access and uh, the resources that they have. But let me say something uh, right off the bat, and, it, and it, it comes from a question that started sort of before this talk. We talk about modern nation states. The lines that you see drawn here are modern nation states. Well, a nation is a group of people with a common history, heritage, language, culture, vision. Nations are, for example, the Kurds, the Canadians, the Blackfoot, the French. <laughs> Those are nations. We have a lot of nations in this world. States are different entities. States are, there's sort of three basic things to states. States are governments, they have territory and boundaries, and they enjoy the legal status of sovereignty. Nations and states may fit and they may not fit. 
We have this idea of the modern nation state. There are now 194 of them. When the UN declaration, uh, the UN charter was signed in San Francisco in 1945, there were 50. So that gives you some idea about states. And most of those new ones, of course, came from Africa. Most of those new states, if you will, came from Africa. Many of them came from the former Yugoslavia and from the former Soviet Union in a post-Cold War era. But we now have 194 of them. And of course, the most recent one that uh, is not illustrated on this map is just south of Egypt. Sudan has recently split. And the Palestinians, a nation without a state, have applied for sovereign status or state status, if you will, in uh, the United Nations. Now, we're going to borrow a little bit from Orwell. All states are sovereign. All states are equal in the eyes of international law. But some states are more equal than others. A little Orwell right there. There are strong states and there are weak states. And the level of sovereignty is crucial here. But there's a thesis that we start um, one of our classes with, and I'll talk about that class here in a minute, uh, about the Middle East. And that is that the lines drawn in the Middle East, the states, are a European construct. In fact, the modern nation state as a concept is a European construct. And it may or may not fit well onto all parts of the country, but particularly the Middle East. The modern nation state as a European construct does not, in fact, in many cases, fit well onto the Middle East. And anytime you see straight line borders, oh, there's a bunch, they probably don't represent ethno-geographic realities. Straight line borders do not represent ethno-geographic realities. Now, I haven't added up the mileage, but which country that you're very familiar with has some serious long straight line borders? The United States. Think about that. Think about that. There are three basic problems with this modern nation state construct. Number one, nations without states. And in the Middle East, the Palestinians are a nation without a state. The Kurds are a nation without a state. Before May 15, 1948, Jews were a nation without a state. The second problem is multinational states. They tend to break. They tend to bust. Yugoslavia is a classic example of a multinational state that broke, that busted. Nationalism is a very important force that motivates. The third basic problem with this construct, though, are nations divided between states. Nations divided between states. The Koreans are a nation divided between states. The Germans were a nation divided between states. Mexicans are a nation divided between states. Mexico used to go as far north as Colorado and Wyoming. Why does everything start in California start with a Santa Rosa? <laughs> because it belonged to Mexico. So straight line borders, power, strong states can take territory and create statehood. Nations divided between states. My wife is from Montana. The Blackfeet are a nation divided between states. So with that construct in mind, take a look at that map and think about what's going on in the Middle East. How nationalistic are the Egyptians? We're not going to talk about this uh, much specifically, but there was Nasser in the 1950s, and he tried to have pan-Arabism. Did it work? Not really. Not really. So what is an Arab? What is the Middle East? What are the states in the Middle East? These are all questions that international relations scholars, political science nerds like me get to deal with on a daily basis, and it's really a lot of fun. So there's MENA, there's North Africa. What do we mean by the Arab Spring? We mean the dynamics where citizens of Arab states have demanded change, have demanded change generally away from autocratic rule toward more self-rule or at least more democracy. I hope you can all see that at the bottom. I try to make these in, in very big letters. So we've got MENA, Middle East, North Africa. We've got sort of a definition of the Arab Spring of last spring. And um, this is important to me because last spring, 2011, I was teaching PS 334 Middle East Politics at Aquinas College. What a riot. <laughs> we had a great time. I didn't understand what was going to happen. And that's going to come up in another slide. But through that class, we do our model Arab League, as uh, Amy uh, intimated, where we role play members of the 22 uh, member states in the Arab League. Do you think we can get resolutions passed in the Arab League? <laughs> Very difficult. Again, a huge misperception on behalf of American decision makers that the Arab world is united, that all Muslims are alike or think alike. Big problem. So literally at about uh, week five or six or seven in the middle of, fe of February, we threw the syllabus out the window. Had to. Things were changing so rapidly. Really a lot of fun. So did we see this coming? 
I don't think the intelligence community saw this coming. They're, they're the ones that are supposed to have their ear to the ground. I don't think intelligence community saw this coming. Uh, there were very, very few academics that saw this coming in. Professor St. Clair, who's in the back back there, he's gonna wave his hand here in a second. He might remember this. Uh, we were at a model Arab League a few years ago where Dr. Uh, Zuhr was, was the guest speaker from the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations that sponsors the model Arab League. The National Council on U.S. Arab Relations out of Washington, D.C. She was the guest speaker. She's from the U.S. Army War College. And she said, I've been doing survey research. I've been doing some real public opinion survey and the Middle East is gonna bust. These people are ready for democracy. And we're sitting in the back going, nah. <laughs> She's wrong. These authoritarian governments, they have it all tied up. She was absolutely right. She's one of the few academics that I know that really understood what was going on. And there may be some more of them, but she was one that I had a, a, a pretty good um, introduction to uh, uh, what was going on. She said it right there to us in a room to a, of about 50. And then we, we talked to her afterwards. And she knew her stuff. She had it right. Did leaders beyond Middle East, North Africa see this coming? Nope. Pretty straightforward. How about leaders within MENA? Really big question. How out of touch are or some of these leaders? Pretty seriously out of touch, aren't they? Pretty seriously out of touch with this Arab Spring, this Arab awakening. So intelligence community, academics, leaders beyond MENA, leaders within MENA, MENA. How out of touch are they? How about this big question? How out of touch are all of we with the actual citizens of MENA? That's what it says at the bottom, and I'll read that again. How out of touch are all of we with the actual citizens of the Middle East and North Africa? I think probably pretty seriously out of touch. And I think a little diplomacy can go a long way. I'm not sure that we uh, have engaged in that enough. A little diplomacy can go a long way. Listening to these people would really, really help. Would really help. So, how out of touch are we? Uh, with that introduction then, let's just do another quick introductory item and talk about the different kinds of governments in the Middle East, North Africa. As a political science nerd, this is important to us. What kind of governments do they have? They have kingdoms, they have dictatorships, they have democracy slash republics, and they have rentier states. And we're gonna talk about that for just a minute. So, kingdoms. Bahrain, Jordan, Kuwait, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. Well, I think an emirate's pretty much a king, but this is this loose federation of seven of them. So at least, there's at least six, six kingdoms. And think about relationships that strong states have with these six states. Bahrain, Jordan, Kuwait, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Of course, the United States and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and UAE have very good relationships, don't they? One word, three letters. <laughs> Oil. How about dictatorships? Well, there's Iraq, there's Libya, there's Tunisia and Egypt. Well, wait, Tunisia? Wait, I thought that guy was elected. I thought the president of Egypt was elected. Now nah, I'm calling this guy a dictator. He's been in office too long. How about republics that are really dictatorships? You could put Tunisia back on this list. Algeria is supposedly a, a, a republic. Lebanon, Iraq, again. Yemen, Iraq, Egypt, again. Iran has a couple of stars on it because they're not Arab. Uh, and they're really a theocracy. Iran is a theocracy. Syria, republics that are really dictatorships. And finally, um, we're not quite there yet. Uh, so seven republics that are dictatorships, kind of adding it up together. Um, there's only 14 here. Who's missing? Maybe Tur Turkey's not in the Middle East. Turkey's in Central Asia. Turks aren't Arab. They might be Muslim, but they're not Arab. How about Palestine? Uh -huh. Palestine, Palestinians are a nation without a state. And they certainly don't have a democracy. They are voting, and guess who's winning? Not the PLO. Hezbollah and Hamas are winning elections in certain territories of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. That's interesting. Fourth, rentier states. This is a really interesting uh, sort of comparative politics term that's pretty important. Rentier states are states that get um, uh, their wealth from hopefully exports, but from the outside world. Now you can say export earnings are a good thing. In Central America, we talk about banana republics. We talk about mono cash crop economies. Generating export earnings is not a bad thing. The problem is that uh, uh, these rentier states get so much money from this one particular commodity uh, that they don't really have to be accountable to their public. 
In other words, oil, these governments can make so much oil off the sale of oil that they don't have to be accountable to, the, to, their, to their citizens. So now we can go back to that sort of sophomoric sixth grade thing that says uh, no representation, no taxation without representation. Well, that's not really that sophomoric, is it? That's pretty important. You pay into your government, you want some response. You pay into your government, you want them to respond to you. You pay into your, your government, you get some citizenship. In general, rentier states do not have citizens that pay into their government. Therefore, governments don't have to respond to them. Rentier states. Watch out for Nigeria. Watch out for Venezuela. It'll be interesting to see what, uh, what's going on there. You think that Mexico, maybe, may, maybe the PRI in Mexico has been getting away with this for a long time. The Institutionalized Revolutionary Party in Mexico that, that was in power up until the 2000 elections when Coca-Cola Company took over Mexico. It'd be Vicente Fox. So they don't have to be accountable to their public. There's no collection of taxes. Governments of these states become autonomous from their societies. They're unaccountable to their citizens and therefore autocratic. In whatever form you want to say, dictator, kingship, republics that really are dictatorships, however you want to put it. Rentier states, a very important concept in comparative politics. Well, uh, I want to um, highlight a particular item here. Um, let me show you this website real quick. Uh, uh, there's a lot of really good information that can come from this website as you uh, study the Arab Spring. If you just Google uh, Guardian Arab Spring, you'll pull up this item. And it looks like this. Let's see if we can get it to work. The Guardian is a newspaper out of Europe. And it's pretty nice. It's got countries across the bottom. And if you navigate this tool right here, it'll pull you down chronologically. So I advise all of you good citizens to practice this. So if you go down here and we click on uh, tens of thousands of Egyptians returned to Tahrir Square in a show of national unity. This is uh, in the middle of May. And you can click on that. It'll take you to the Guardian article. If you click on ones, uh, th th so, so the blue ones with the world, that's kind of the UN logo. And it's going to talk about international response. If you click on the ones with the fist, it's talking about the people knocking back at Halloween. They're knocking back. They're talking to their government. They want some input. They're tired of rentier states, or they're tired of dictatorships, or they're tired of, of authoritarian governments. And they're making demands. So the Guardian Arab Spring, it'll pull this thing right up. A really nice website. A really nice website. And it goes all the way chronologically. It'll bring you right up to October, middle of October. I'm sure they're still adding to it. Let's uh, introduce some macro policy in the Middle East relative to the United States first. And then I have a bunch of material on case studies, but I think we're going to skip that in lieu of time and go uh, sort of right to Egypt and Libya. I'm going to keep an eye on my clock right here. Um, Relative to U.S. foreign policy, the pursuit of national interest, how about access to petroleum? That's high on the list, isn't it? Maintaining and preserving access to petroleum, regardless of the kind of government. Regardless of the kind of government that's in place. So support for the conditions of access to petroleum. In a very basic textbook, Anderson, Siebert, and Wagner say, quote, exploitation and protection of petroleum products in Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates is primary on the United States national interest list. Fundamental to U.S. interests, access to petroleum. Saudi Arabia, how about protecting Saudi Arabia and OPEC in general or support of the Seven Sisters? OPEC is really, 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 really smart. Members of OPEC export, in general, crude oil. They don't add the value to the oil. They leave the value added to U.S. multinational corporations. That keeps them involved in the game. It doesn't challenge their profitability. Let's take a look at what Mossadegh in 19, the early 1950s did in Iran. Mossadegh was, a, was an ardent nationalist, 
he was a me he was a, a member of the Iranian uh, uh, government, and at one point he was elected uh, premier or prime minister. He nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company owned by the British. What happened to Mossadegh? Anybody? He was overthrown in a British Secret Service and CIA-sponsored coup d'etat. It's very straightforward. That's a part of all basic history books. He challenged the profit margin. Leaders in the Middle East have learned from that. They don't do that. They export crude oil. You don't challenge the profit margin. And, they're all, they're all, and they all gain. Everybody wins, except when your gas prices reach about $5 a gallon or European prices reach uh, high, high, gallon, high, high prices. So support for the Seven Sisters is certainly a part of uh, American foreign policy. Um, another, therefore, and consequently, I would say, lack of support for democracy and sovereignty in Arab states. And this can be tricky because Kuwait is literally about four, three or four straight lines drawn in the sand by the British. Because Iraq has a really strong historical claim to Kuwait. The British created Kuwait as, as, as a way of maintaining access to that petroleum. So they help create Kuwaiti sovereignty. On the other hand, the more interference there is by foreign countries or multinational corporations, arguably, the less sovereign states are. They have to answer to other, other entities. By the way, sovereignty is, we, we mentioned that word a couple times, it means no higher authority. Sovereignty means no higher authority. I have a 17-year-old daughter who we've been trying to raise to be sovereign, and doggone, she's bringing it back at us. <laughs> no higher authority. That's a tough one. Dr. Duncan, be careful with that as you raise your children. He's, Dr. Duncan is soon to be a parent. Uh, so we can talk about the Shah of Iran or the House of Saud or the Suez Crisis or Lebanon. These are all instances where the United States uh, probably didn't support democracy. And of course in Iran, this is a really crucial moment in 1954 because we put the Shah back in place. And the Shah, of course, is a kingdom. It's, a, it's aristocracy. What happened in Iran in 1979? He was overthrown by the Ayatollah and this theocracy. So let's imagine, you can hear me, let's imagine a scale of democracy. This is more democratic, this is less democratic. This is more democratic, this is less democratic. The Mossadegh and his premiership, they were, you know, they were kind of in the middle, they weren't completely democratic, but they were more democratic. The Shah was down here less democratic. What type of government took over in 1979? They're off the charts. The question is whether or not strong state support for these autocratic governments might have not been a very good idea. It certainly is in the short-term interest of us to have access to oil and certain uh, economic interests in our country. But boy, that revolution in 79 was pretty serious in Iran, and it, and it remains. Ahmadinejad, as the president, is, is a figurehead. He's not really in charge. The theocracy is. Uh, how about support for Saddam Hussein? He was our guy. Let's not forget Saddam Hussein was our guy. We not only helped put him in place, but we supported him in the eight-year war against Iran in a sort of realpolitik balance of power. But while we were doing that, we also had Iran-Contra. We were selling weapons to Iran illegally by way of Israel to fund the death squads in Nicaragua. Wow. How about Kuwait? Now, this is a tough one because uh, the 19... I, I remember very specifically in uh, the summer of 1990 when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And here's what happened. Iraq was losing export earnings. Every time the price of oil goes down, they lose export earnings. And they needed to pay for this eight-year war that they just had with Iran. So they kind of camped themselves on the border of Iraq. And they said, Iraq, uh, Kuwait, every time you lower your oil prices, something bad's going to happen. And eventually then, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Well, there was evidence that Kuwait was sideways drilling. This is the border. Kuwait was sideways drilling into Iraqi oil. That was one of the problems. And of course, we already mentioned this historical claim that Iraq makes for Kuwait. But the international community, probably rightfully so, in January of 1991, January 16th, I think, or 15th, made a bid to protect Kuwaiti sovereignty. So on the one hand, Kuwait can be seen as support for sovereignty, but it's certainly also seen as access to petroleum. Because at that moment, Japan was, depending on the source you used, was 73% or 74% dependent on Kuwaiti oil. And they literally helped pay the price for the international efforts to remain, to regain and, and maintain Kuwaiti oil. Well, here we are with the March 2003 invasion of Iraq. Maybe we'll come back to that. 
How about support for a sovereign Israel? This is not a bad thing. Israel is a very uh, democratic government. It's probably the only uh, sort of multi-party democracy in, in the Middle East. Um, and it involves then, this is national interest, it involves political aid, economic aid, military aid. Uh, and then it's, it's important for political scientists to say, regardless of border expansion, Israel's borders have expanded. That's a fact. If you want to argue about Israeli sovereignty, we don't have to go there. Israel is sovereign, but Israel has expanded the borders. Therefore, there's a lack of support internationally, and certainly on behalf of the United States, although we give them a lot of money, for sovereign Palestine. So it's interesting that the previous President Bush, the President Bush II, said, and I'm not sure if he knew what he was saying, but I think he did. He said, uh, we need a Palestinian state. And recall the definitions that we gave earlier tonight, a Palestinian state. That means a sovereign Palestine. And Obama now has said, well, sure, but not right now. But the PLO is trying to play this kind of cool. They're making a bid in front of the General Assembly like they're supposed to. Uh, Yasser Arafat went from being the number one terrorist in the international community to a recognized head of state and has been given lots of aid by strong states. Uh, let's, let's skip over Tunisia, although it is the spark. Oh, there, there's our buddy, though. There, there, there's the Democratic um, Ben Ali. Hmm. In office uh, since 1987? That's called a dictatorship. Democratically elected since 1987? I'd like to see those ballots. <laughs> 1960 in uh, Texas, maybe, or, or Chicago? I don't know. Oh, and, uh, that's a, and these folks are smart, right? They know English. Game over. These are smart folks. We'll pop down. This, I love this cartoon, then. This is Tunisia in the red, and that's Mubarak on the next domino, the domino theory. That's Tunisia in the red domino, and there's Mubarak, who's next, or Egypt. Uh, we could talk about Morocco. Uh, these guys know what they're doing. There's some pictures, uh, uh, some in English. There's, there's the, the king. Again, this is a, a kingship, a kingdom. Jordan, got lots of notes there. We'll come back to that, maybe. Um, hmm. Tough situation. When people hit the streets, the police tend to respond. Egypt. This is really an important case. And I just want to say two or three things about Egypt. Um, Mubarak came to power in 1981 and was given emergency power straight up because of uh, Anwar Sadat's assassination. He quickly killed five of the assassinations. Assassins rebuilt bridges between other Arab states that were destroyed when Egypt made peace with Israel. This is important. Because at Camp David, when Egypt recognized Israeli sovereignty, they were promptly kicked out of the Arab League. And the headquarters of the Arab League that were in Cairo were moved. So rebuilding the uh, sort of pan-Arab that Nasser uh, was uh, very much a champion of earlier was important for uh, Mubarak, but he's also, also a, a significant ally of the United States. Um, in fact, one of the first things he did is he got Egypt readmitted into the Arab League, the League of Arab States. Uh, let's roll down to the idea that Mubarak um, government was pretty repressive. I think we know that. Uh, we don't need to talk about that time. But this is a serious protest, isn't it? Now, two, two other things to note about Egypt. The military. The military remained neutral. That's a really important dynamic in political development. It was a big deal in this country when Harry Truman flew to that island and fired MacArthur. Maintaining civilian control of the military is a really important step in political development. Maintaining civilian control of militaries. Who's in charge in Russia right now? Putin. Putin. Putin just reasserted himself, didn't he? Who's in charge of half of Latin America? Militaries. It's an interesting question. Castro has it. Castro has elections, but there's only one party. He's the military, right? His, his army, his military, his people. Maintaining civilian control of the military is crucial. Well, the military remained neutral here, and this is pretty important in Egypt. Um, It got pretty serious, didn't it? So, and, and so Mubarak had, had troops loyal just to him. There's a few conclusions here on uh, Egypt that I want to make a few points of. First, social media matters. This isn't the point. Social media matters. These people were smart, weren't they? These were young, smart people. And they said, all right, let's meet at noon on the corner of Fifth and Elm. Oh, the military's going to be there. Okay, let's go two blocks over later. They knew how to use this. So social media matters. 
I just got a cell phone not long ago. It's one of those pay-as-you-go things. Four people have the number. My wife, my two kids, and my mom. <laughs> Mom's in Oregon. I got I to gotta get with it. Because if I don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss out. And that's what was going on in the Middle East. The social media matters. It really does matter. So let's talk for just a minute about U.S. policy during the Arab Spring before Libya. Um, the general attitude, so this Pew Research of May 2011 says, uh, well, the Arab Spring fails to improve the U.S. image. Quote, moreover, many of the concerns that have driven animosity toward the United States in recent years are still present. A perception that the U.S. acts unilaterally, Iraq, opposition to the war on terror in the Middle East, because that's working well. We can talk about that if we want. And fears of America as a military threat. Why does Iran think they need, Iran's not Arab again, why does Iran think they need nuclear weapons? Because we militarily occupy Iraq. Bam. That's called realpolitik. Henry Kissinger understands that. So this, this quote is pretty important. The concerns that have driven animosity toward the U.S. really are, are still in there. A perception that the U.S. acts unilaterally and not diplomatically or multilaterally, opposition to the war on terror, and the fears of America as a military threat. And in countries such as Jordan, Lebanon, and Pakistan, most say their own governments cooperate too much with the U.S. What do people want? They want sovereignty. They want no higher authority. They want governments that answer to them and not outside powers. People want governments that answer to them and not outside interests. So for many in MENA, this is a sovereignty issue. This is a political issue. This is about political power. This is about sovereignty and political power and having legitimate governments that answer to them. Local control, less outside or strong state interference. Mubarak was a staunch ally. But your president said Mubarak must go without delay. Even a demand from Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah that Mubarak should be allowed to leave with dignity was ignored. ignored. And remember what, what, what Mubarak first said, no, let, let, let me stay until the next election. And the public said no. Well, let me stay until September or whatever it was. And the public said no. Well, let me stay until next week. And the public said, you're out of here. <laughs> These people really hit the streets, didn't they? Well, Obama, interestingly, was uh, thrilled by the change, if you want to talk about, again, U.S. Arab Spring policy before Libya. Uh, with reference to Tunisia, the U.S. was kind of laissez-faire, but pro, we, we gave the lip service of pro-democracy. That's important. <laughs> um, by stepping down, uh, President Mubarak responded uh, to the Egyptian people's hunger for change. But this is not the end to Egypt's transition. It's the beginning, said your president. So how about Libya? Is this a civil war? And if it is, then what about outside intervention? So I do want to go carefully through Libya because I want to make an argument about just war theory in Libya. Um, so the protests begin in Libya on February, the middle of February 15th, middle of February, sparked by, of course, what was going on in Tunisia and Egypt. Again, the domino process, domino process. And the protests begin in Benghazi uh, that were broken up by the police, about 40 injured. Um, it's important to talk about Libya as a product of the European construct, again, as we mentioned earlier. Libyan borders were literally drawn by the outside, by the Ottoman, then the Italian, and the French and British influence. It's a multinational state, so it has these problems. It has straight-line borders, and it's a multinational state. There's the borders, modern-day Libya. Look at those straight-line borders. Tripolitania, Bazan, and Cyrenaica. These are, these are probably different people, if not different. You know, maybe another word for a nation is a tribe certainly different languages, and again, straight line borders do not represent ethnogeographic realities. Uh, I have a lot of notes, if you want to, to talk about the Italian influence on Libya. Very important, very crucial from the late 1920s, early 1930s uh, to uh, 1945. Italian influence on Libya, very important. So, but what do we know about Libya? It's a dictatorship. There are no political parties in Libya, really. Ideology is kind of weird. It doesn't really uh, play, a, play a role, although the Green Book talks about some ideology. Um, it is certainly a military state. It's a military state. There's nepotism. There's serious family rule. You know, we, we saw uh, one of Gaddafi's sons try to step up and take charge. So there's a lot of nepotism. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a lot of uh, domestic inequality, especially with reference to um, political power. So there's this empowered, 
group, not very big, versus a pretty large unempowered group in Libya. The public is disenfranchised. I mean, that, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? But the public is disenfranchised, you have to say it. There's certainly been an increase in unrest, and it is a rentier state. And we've had that conversation then about the relationship between rentier states and democracy and public input. Libya has really nice oil, evidently. I don't know, I don't know much about physics or oil and, and measuring uh, how good crude is, but it's really good stuff. I guess it's really good stuff. So two days later, the government then releases 30 prisoners from jail, gives them weapons, and sends them out to fight the protesters. Several demonstrators were killed. I'll give you political am am amnesty if you go out and fight the protesters. Let's arm the prisoners. He then hires mercenaries, many from Chad, because they want jobs. Protesters execute 50 loyal mercenaries and two Libyan conspirators. By February 20, it is a really bloody crackdown. Within five days, it's a really bloody crackdown. Troops and mercenaries shoot unarmed demonstrators in Benghazi, which is sort of the, has become sort of the capital or spokes, the, the, the main place uh, in the eastern province. It's one of the main cities, but we hear about Benghazi quite a bit. Witnesses report seeing military helicopters flying, firing into crowds of anti-government protesters, so they're protesting, and they get fired upon. Pro and anti-government protests are taking place now in more major cities across the country. Death toll is up to about 230 by uh, February 20. Death toll's up to about 230. Lots of violence. BBC Arabic reports automatic gunfire and tear gas in the capital for the first time. So now we're in Tripoli. This is not good for Gaddafi. The protests have moved to Tripoli. The regime went on the attack. It's a tragedy that Libyans have died, but warned of civil war unless war, order was restored. So the government's trying to restore order, saying you're going to die if you, don't, if you don't stop it. So what, the question is, at what point you know, does this turn into a civil war? This is really important. And keep that date in mind, February 20. There's quite a bit going on. Some military officers call on fellow, fellow soldiers to join the people. So now you have defection of the military. And Gaddafi then delivers this... Um, I don't know how many people saw this last February. Uh, this is pretty, pretty wild, wasn't it? Yeah. Kind of hard to take him seriously from the outside, but boy, you have to because he's been pa in power so long. So long. Calling on supporters to take back the streets. Uh, he has not ordered the use of force yet, but when he does, you're going down. Everything's going to burn. Well, then how do you explain the helicopters firing on people? Because it is an autocratic rule. Gaddafi's in charge. That's very real. Britain, France, so, so now we have some response. Britain, France, and Tunisia, and it's interesting Tunisia because they just chucked their guy, Ben Ali, but remember they shared a pretty serious border. And what, what happens, what do normal people do, a lot of regular folks do, when war breaks out? They take off. Those are called refugees. Refugees are, it's a really tough spot to be. And if you're a human being, it's really tough to be a refugee. Whether it's an economic refugee or a political refugee or a war refugee, it's really tough to be a refugee especially in uh, developing countries. So now we're talking about 85,000 Egyptians even that have gone over there to work because uh, jobs in Egypt were hard to get, weren't they? It's one of the reasons why Mubarak went down. We didn't go, go over that. I apologize. But, but the econ it's the economy, isn't it, in many of these places? But it's also political. So they're um, on this Libyan-Tunisian border. So Britain, France, and Tunisia try to respond to refugees, in particular these Egyptians that are hanging. Now, this is really important. The International Criminal Court uh, is a newly created international organization out of the Rome Statutes of 2002. The International Court of Justice, that's been around since the League of Nations had a different name, adjudicates disputes between states. The International Court of Justice adjudicates disputes between states. The International Criminal Court goes after individuals that may be guilty of war crimes. Its history is rather unprecedented. Following World War II, we had individual or ad hoc war crimes tribunals. You'll recall the one in Nuremberg and Tokyo. Ad hoc, one time only. Let's put these, Professor Duncan and I were talking about putting uh, bad guys on trial. Let's put war criminals on trial and let the public see it and have it run through a sort of a legal process. The next two were in Sarajevo and Rwanda. Since then, the international community has created a permanent war crimes tribunal. 
the International Criminal Court. It's really hard. It's really hard to get an individual in front of the ICC. What it takes, essentially, is the state that they're guilty in, the state that they exist in, can't try them or won't try them. Can't try them or won't, won't try them. So, for example, people in Chile tried to, tried to get General Pinochet, who we put in power, by the way, in, in September of 1973, uh, rung up on war crimes. In fact, people in Spain tried to get him extradited. But it, it's hard to do. So most recently, there have been two important cases, Slobodan Milosevic of Serbia and Radovan Karadovic, otherwise known as the Rat. Uh, Milosevic uh, hung himself uh, throughout the, as, as the trial ended, and I think uh, Karadovic is still on trial. Um, I apologize for not knowing the answer to that. But this is really important. What that meant then is that Serbia, or the area that, that uh, they, were, they were governing over, couldn't handle it, so they got sent to the ICC. So the international community then is essentially saying, the Libyan government's not going to be able to handle this. So announcing at the beginning of March that it would launch an investigation into war crimes means that the Libyan government's not going to check itself. The Libyan government's not going to check itself. Well, what government would? Has the United States joined the International Criminal Court? No. We argue it's a violation of our sovereignty. We argue that if, if we have war criminals, we'll put them on our own trial. We'll, we'll handle that ourselves. And I suppose we have in a couple of instances, relative to Abu Ghraib, there have been some minor or some low-level uh, service people that have been rung up on that. How about the decision makers? Whether those are war crimes or not, it's an interesting question. Or uh, the, the, what's the base in Cuba, um, Guantanamo, where we had political prisoners. So we haven't signed the International Criminal Court for obvious uh, sovereign reasons. But that's a big deal. So now international response. Resolution 1730 of February 26 demands an immediate, immediate end of the ceasefire. Let's say one other thing. This is a Security Council resolution, the UN Security Council. Five permanent members, the winners of the war. Winners of wars get to make the rules, and then 10 rotating members. The winners of the war, meaning World War II, United States, Great Britain, Soviet Union, now Russia. It was the Republic of China, but now it's the People's Republic of China and, of course, France. They have veto power. There's a General Assembly where it's one country, one vote. There are 194 of them. Resolutions in the General Assembly are not binding. Resolutions in the Security Council are binding, but only if strong states want to enforce them. So one of the sort of uh, real politic things we say about international law and organizations is, hey, they're really effective as long as strong states want them to be effective. So here we are with the Security Council and, uh, authorizing, or, or rather calling in Resolution 1730, uh, an end to the violence. Obviously, it's, it's worded, it's very long. We can look at that if you want. Um, Libya should fulfill the legitimate demands of the population, so become a more legitimate government. It should refer this to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. There's an arms embargo. There's a travel on ban that bans Libyan leaders, meaning you can't take off with your money. Libyan leaders, you've got to stay there. And a freeze on their assets on certain Libyan leaders because they have money outside, those darn Swiss. They're good bankers. These are what we call strategies available in, the, uh, strategies available in international politics short of going to war. Strategies available. Despite the requirements of this Security Council resolution, Qaddafi continued to pound opposition with brutal force for the next two and a half weeks. It was pretty ugly. So that in mid-March, the Security Council passes Resolution 1973, creating first a no-fly zone that goes into effect the next day. The no-fly zone goes into effect the next day. This resolution authorizes member states to take all necessary measures to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under the threat of attack in Libya, including Benghazi, while excluding an occupation force. So a no-fly zone, stop the bombing. That's what Resolution 1973 says, without an occupation force, and all of the other items in the previous resolution. Uh, meaning arms embargo, ICC referral, et cetera, et cetera, assets freeze, reinforcing that. This is a big deal. This means the international community has responded. Of course, China and Russia abstain. Remember that those five permanent members have veto power. They could have stopped this. They didn't vote yes, but they didn't vote no. Russia argues that the resolution was hastily adopted. NATO takes command of this arms embargo in late March and the air operations the next day, enforcing the no-fly zone. 
This is the international response to Libya. Every day, I go back and forth about whether war can ever be justified. So I want to take this break right now and ask Amy to distribute a handout on just war theory. I've, uh, if you would, um, there, I think I made 30 or 40, so maybe you share if we could divide it in half. So I've got this handout uh, on just war theory. And the question then is, is the international response to Libya justifiable? Does the international response to Libya meet just war theory? And this is pretty important for scholars in international politics. There was a really uh, important article that came out in uh, March of 2003 that said preemptive war is not justifiable. Preemptive war is not justifiable under just war theory. And of course, the argument that the Bush administration used against Iraq is that this is preemptive war. We need to stop them before they attack somebody. This is by Nada Crawford in a, an important uh, academic journal called Perspectives on Politics, March 2003. Nada Crawford from uh, Brown University, I think. Preemptive war is not justifiable. So the question is, does the international response meet just war criteria? Uh, do we have, uh, that's it. Can you get, try to get next to somebody who has one? How many, do we have enough? We do, probably don't have enough. I will bring it up in word form. Give me a second. Too many of you guys came to this talk tonight. <laughs> That's good. Thank you for the pause. Nope. With, uh, with big type. That's what we want. Uh, can you see that? There are three parts to just war theory. There's the justice of the war, as you said, vellum. There's the justice during the war, juice in bello. And there's the justice after the war, just post bellum. And the justice of the war has about five different arguments here on this short handout. Now what you have in front of you is about six or 700 years of just war theory on two pages. <laughs> so it is by no means you know, the, the final deal here. And there's, but there is, a, there is a bibliography attached. In fact, the um, article that I mentioned by Nada Crawford is on there. It's about the sixth or seventh one down. Nada Crawford, Just War Theory in U.S. Counter Terror War. It's a very interesting piece. But uh, obviously, a war, a war is waged as a last resort only. Last resort only. All nonviolent options must be exhausted before the use of force can be justified. So all the tools of diplomacy have to be employed. Now time is of the essence, isn't it? Because people are getting killed. But we're talking about Security Council resolutions to weapons inspections. How about shuttle diplomacy, like the Kissinger folks did, trying to get the Arabs and Israelis back, back together, that culminated in Camp David, to summit meetings. So all the tools of diplomacy have to, have to be in play here. But time is important because 100,000 people were hacked. I'm sorry, 800,000 people were hacked in 100 days in Rwanda. And I'm not sure what that means. I don't know how to get my head around that. But the international community did not respond. In fact, your administration, the Clinton folks, called it ethnic cleansing. Because if you call it genocide, you have to act. The International, the Genocide Convention says, if you call it genocide, you have to act. So let's just not call it genocide. Pretty serious stuff, pretty serious stuff. Now, I don't know that this was called genocide in Libya. I haven't seen reference to that. But time is of the essence, isn't it? So I want to make the argument, and I can't believe I'm doing this because I, I go on record here. I'm not a war guy at all. But I want to make the argument that the international response to Libya does indeed meet the first part, the first third of just war theory, that is the justice of the war. All the, tool, all, all the tools of diplomacy were tried at least in that short-term period that we had. Uh, the war being, third, the war being waged by a legitimate authority. Well, uh, Article 2.1 of the Security, of the UN Charter and Article 1.1 says it's the United Nations. Nobody else can, can authorize war. Now, of course, they do, right? States have sovereignty and the UN really doesn't. The UN is only as effective as strong states want it to be. But that's the, the international legal dynamic here. The Security Council is the one that can authorize this, and they did. But the, there's another important note here. 
The African Union was behind this. The League of Arab States was behind this, mostly, not Libya. The European Union was behind this. So this wasn't just a UN Security Council strong state action. It wasn't just that. The war can only be fought to redress a wrong suffered. Self-defense is the only unambiguous justification for the use of force. And if you look here under 4D, and we'll get more handouts for you if you want them, or I can send them to you. Uh, preventative war, war ways to defeat a potential adversary before its military comes to, to, to catch you is not justifiable. Let me make these, this type bigger. A little bigger. Is the cause just? Wars of aggression are not just. Self-defense is. Revenge is not a proper aim of war. Now, I teach at Aquinas College, and like I said, uh, I'm not particularly religious or Catholic, but I really appreciate our Dominican heritage, and I really like what Big Tom said about this. Revenge is not a proper aim of war. War, fifth, war can be just only if it's fought with a reasonable chance of success. Death and injury incurred in a hopeless cause are not morally justifiable. Six, the ultimate goal of war is to reestablish peace. Which brings us to seven, the second part of just war theory that is just in bello. Uh, and, I, and I don't know, I don't know yet if this war is just in its, in its operation. I'm not sure. But I want to make the argument that this war does indeed meet, or it's arguable that it, this war does meet the first part of just war theory, the justice of the war. That's a tough thing to do. Because on Monday I wake up saying, nah. On Tuesday maybe, and on Wednesday, wait, this is Tuesday. On Sunday I woke up saying no, on Tuesday, Monday maybe, and here it is Tuesday saying yeah. Innocent people. Now, it's a civil war, though. That's problematic, isn't it? It's a civil war. That's problematic. <coughs> so whether the international response uh, meets it in terms of the justice during the war and after the war remains to be seen. That's important. So despite the civil war nature of the situation, the reasons that this war meet just war theory are the following. The wrong suffered. The killing of innocents. So these are, these are, if you will, I'm going to make a, a sort of a freshman thesis here. Argument one, the killing of innocents. Argument two, all other efforts failed. This guy was not going to respond in a short amount of time. From UN uh, resolutions to global and regional and unilateral support, this guy wasn't stopping. And thirdly, the international mandate, this legitimate authority argument. UN, the Arab League, U, uh, African Union, and NATO, et cetera. Gave it, gave it this legitimate authority. A few conclusions. Uh, we can talk about other NATO countries. Uh, so, conclusions. We didn't see this coming. There are a lot of illegitimate governments in the Middle East, and the people are making demands on them. But third, and something that we haven't said yet, and I want to make this a very specific point, these are political demands. These are not necessarily religious. These are not crazy Arabs hitting the streets. These demands are very Western-oriented dynamics, aren't they? They want legitimate governments. They want legitimate governments. These are political demands. Fourth, there's a domino effect. This is kind of obvious, but it's a conclusion that we have to say. Again, people want more representation in democracy. Five. How about the uh, argument of poor economies? This is certainly part of it. So part of it is, is political demands. The government's not responding. But there's, a, there's an economic element here, isn't there? There's low wages. There's high unemployment. There's an educated public. And their expectations are higher. So some of these demands are indeed economic. BBC reports the main drivers of the unrest have been poverty, rising prices, social exclusion, anger over corruption. That's political. And personal enrichment among the political elite. That's political. People are getting rich off my back said the guy in Tunisia. He was just trying to protect himself from the police. He kept getting beat up, beaten up by the police, didn't he? The one, uh, the guy that was selling the stuff. And then this demographic bulge of young people unable to find work. That's a political and economic issue. Six, as we mentioned earlier, technology matters. 
Technology matters. What is, Amy, what is Facebook anyway? We're going live on Facebook with this thing. I got a page, I haven't checked it in three months. I'm not sure what's going on. The role of the military is critical here. Egypt's revolt was enabled because the military was unwilling to fire on the public. Now, Mubarak had an army that was loyal to him, and they did that. But the, but the Egyptian military stayed pretty in the middle. Uh, Libya's revolt, mm -mm, civil war, and uh, uh, it, the, the Gaddafi used his military. Although some of those defected, and that's pretty important, isn't it? So the role of the military is really crucial here. Role of history. Well, much of the Middle East, I would argue, again, as mentioned, is a byproduct of this colonial and neocolonial history. So straight line borders. Um, northern support for dictators and rentier states. They don't want it. We keep saying democracy, but we're not necessarily exporting that. It's time that we do. Time that we do. And again, finally, this international response, Libya. We just talked about that. But, but one uh, last item. Are you sure this is really justifiable? Students keep asking me. I keep asking myself. Is this really about protecting opposition in Libya? Or is this about France and Italy maintaining access to this very good petroleum across the Mediterranean? And with that, I say thank you. We'll have questions and answers. Thank you. <laughs> if we need to, we'll get some more handouts on the just war theory. So, yes, sir. Go ahead and make that argument. With UN resolutions? Oh, they didn't have UN resolutions. Yeah. It was raised by a German authority? No, the, uh, let, let me speak to that first one. The, the, the international mandate in Iraq was weapons inspections. The international mandate in Iraq was weapons inspections. It wasn't to take out Saddam Hussein. Now, it was in Afghanistan. So you might make the argument in Afghanistan that it met just war theory on the first part. But in Iraq, the mandate was weapons inspections. Be sure and read the work by Scott Ritter, one of your colonels. He was one of the weapons inspector guys. And of course, the United States then jumped right over the weapons inspections and went to war. I remember it very carefully. I was in a pub in Ireland in March 2003. I was over there for a semester. Yeah. So, that, so, so on, on that point, it's a good question, but yep, the, the international mandate was weapons inspections. Yeah. yeah yes, ma'am. No. Oh, you're making sure it works. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I remember hearing a little bit about the role of the Bush administration and the exportation of democracy. Not really sure where That's that good. came from. Yeah. Do her. Now I'll make fun of everybody. And, and my students, I try to be both left and right and in there. Not good. Been there. Is this on TV? I'm no Frank Caliendo. Well, so, so let's go to the, these two questions relate to each other, don't we? Uh, the first question asks, well, what about the war in Iraq? Didn't that have a mandate to take out Saddam Hussein? The answer is no. And the second question is, then what about export promotion? Well, think about the justification for the war in Iraq. It was fluid, wasn't it? First, it was weapons of mass destruction. And why did we think Iraq had weapons of mass destruction? Because we gave them to them. <laughs> Ser seriously. This chemical and biological weapons. And, and in fact, they were used against Kurds. Saddam Hussein is absolutely guilty of genocide. Uh, read the very good chapter by Samantha Power in her book, uh, A Problem from Hell, America in the Age of Genocide. Absolutely guilty. Yet we were supporting Iraq at the time in 1985 when that genocide and, and others took place. So Webb is a mass destruction. Couldn't find him. I remember the PowerPoint presentation by Colin Powell, and I'm still mad at Colonel, uh, that, that, that General Powell. Because I think he knew. And he waited four years to come out, if you will. Secondly, export democracy. Well, give me an example where the United States has exported democracy in the Middle East. Seriously. And I don't mean that tongue-in-cheek. In Israel, sure, may maybe in Libya now, in Egypt now, but not while we supported Mubarak, not while we supported some of these other dictators. So, so maybe, so maybe getting rid of Saddam Hussein, yes. Getting rid of Saddam Hussein, the world is better off without him, isn't it? Absolutely. But I would argue not the way we went about it, because we went about it very unilaterally. The, the Bush administration can talk about a coalition of the willing. They can talk about support from Great Britain. When you look at the troop process, the United States mandated about 97 to 98% of that war. That's pretty darn unilateral. So, weapons of mass destruction, democracy promotion, going after a bad guy, sure, where were we when he was, you know, taking on genocide? What were the other justifications for the war? Human rights promotion? 
That's a tough one. Yeah. It's good to see you. Are we, we see you in November yeah. in Chicago? Yeah. Professor that runs uh, Model United Nations. We have a great time in Chicago. Watch out for him. He's from Southern California. <laughs> Keep an eye on those guys. Was, was Iraq a direct threat? Was there any tie to 9-11 in Iraq? Oh, that's the, that's the other justification, of course, 9-11 and terrorism. Was there any tie toward 9-11 in Iraq? None that we found so far. Doesn't mean Saddam Hussein's a bad guy. Doesn't mean that he didn't export that. Doesn't mean he didn't train some of those folks. Go, go ahead. I was just saying that the Lebanese is from Saudi Arabia. Right. Your best friend. Yep. Period. Uh, let, let me reiterate what he said. These folks were, many of them were from Saudi Arabia. The, the government that we, the, the government that has more beheadings per capita than any other recently and the one that we support. By the way, the Saud family might be in trouble. They better pay attention. The, Saad the royal family in Saudi Arabia, they better pay attention because things are changing in the Middle East. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yes, sir. Yeah, he, he asked, uh, uh, while we haven't supported democracy very much in the Middle East, will that change, especially in Tunisia with the last election? That's a really good question. And let me say that domestic politics do matter. Um, one of the tenets of realpolitik that is, is that it's really about power and politics and that domestic politics don't matter, but they do. Domestic politics do, do matter, and they matter even in this country. So changes in administration matter. Now, I'm not sure about Barack Obama's policies in the Middle East yet. I'm really not sure because he's kind of reneged on the Palestinian state thing. But I'm not quite sure. It's much more complex than that, isn't it? You can't just say, yeah, go ahead, Palestine. Where's your, where's your state going to be? Because borders matter. What would the borders of Palestine be? Holy cow. That, who's going to figure that one out? That's really a tough one. So I think the answer to that remains to be seen. And what, it, what does it mean to support democracy? Does it mean to give them aid? Does it mean to uh, you know, legitimize the, the elections? Does it mean to... You know, stay out of their way. Respect the people living there, even if we say have it on your Aha. Uh -huh. So so your previous administration asked for elections in the Palestine and Hamas got elected. Yes, yes ma'am. How about support by paying UNESCO fees? Ah, there you go. Well she said how about supporting our United Nations dues? UNESCO. And UNESCO in particular, United Nations Economic and Social Council. Cut it off? Yep. Yep. No, well, that's a that's a very political question in this country. We pay the most in raw numbers. We pay the least as a percent of our GDP. We pay the most in, per, in numbers, but we pay the least in percent of GDP. Yes, ma'am. What happens to Russia when the French put in Libya and what's going on in Syria? Oh, yeah. She asked, what do I see as the main difference between Libya and what's going on in Syria? And I'm going to balk. Man, I'm not sure what's going on in Syria. I have to admit that I haven't done enough homework on Syria. It's a very different case. The people in, in Libya have taken over some, haven't they? I'm not sure it's going to be stable. It's going to be different in Syria, isn't it? So, so does anybody else want to answer that question? But we're, we're not giving any support to Syria. No, we're not. We're staying out of the way. We support so, wh which gives, which, which, which asks us this question about, well, then is it really about oil right. in Libya? Because yeah. it sure was in Kuwait. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah. He asked, what does Russia have to do with what's going on in Syria? Sure, it matters. Big power politics matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't answer your question. Do yes, sir. Do they leave it to their military that stays on the side? Relatively neutral. That military was still beholden to the government. I mean, No, if they'd have been holding to the government, they would have answered to Mubarak. Okay. They're beholden to the state, the Egyptian state, state the constitution, now, if you will. In Syria, yep. we have a different military that... The role is very different there. Mm -hmm. They're not on the sideline. Right. But aren't the dynamics of the relationship with, between the military and the, and the state in Syria similar to the military and state in Egypt? I think so. Yeah. Why he said, one are, are those dynamics? And the other one doesn't. Yeah. And so, it's, so again, the role of the military is going to matter, isn't it? 
what's the military in Syria going to do? Professor St. Clair, I don't know if you're going to talk about this next week. Any response to that? Well, I can tell you in, in Syria they have uh, a much more pra uh, different factions of ethnic groups. You've got the Jews, um, you've got uh, Assad, the al uh, So in Egypt, maybe there's more of a homogenous population. Maybe that explains why the Egyptian army wouldn't fire on their own people. Uh, but I think in Syria you have a uh, much more uh, fractionalized, balkanized uh, country. Mm -hmm. ba balkanized, did you everybody hear that word? That's a new word in the last 30 years. The balkanized means to fall apart very violently. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I actually did want to say something about how Russia's influence in Syria, one of the things Russia is going to do is continue to buy Syria in oil after the EU cuts uh -huh. it off so that Syria will continue to get money and be able to continue to stay in power. And China and Russia both stepped in and said, we'll buy your oil that the EU is not buying. And that's kind of what Russia's going on with Syria right now, is they're, okay. they're kind of supporting the government that's in place, essentially. That's exactly right, which is exactly what China was doing in Sudan, isn't it? Obsessively uh, supporting the Janjaweed. <whistles> Rough bunch. But that country split is pretty serious. Yep. So oil matters. Oil absolutely matters. So what is our administration's policy going to be towards Saudi Arabia? We really wanted Mubarak out. What's he going to say to the royal family? <coughs> wow. Samantha Power, I mentioned her name. Uh, she, she is a British-born um, uh, person who has degrees from very fine universities and has written this book called A Problem from Hell, America in the Age of Genocide. And she says, we can't sit on the sidelines. We need to intervene. Well. What is she going to say about that one? Because she's now, she's now got the president's ear, this woman. It's, it's controversial. Let me mention another important scholar here, Michael Walzer. Walzer's got a book out called Just and Unjust Wars that uh, is an important contribution to this conversation. And it's, very, it's, it's not that well written, but it's really good. He's a political science nerd, so it's rough to get through. Samantha Powers is a journalist. It's very well written. But Walzer has come out and said, this war in Libya is not justifiable. Michael Walzer, W-A-L-Z-E-R, has come out and said, well, this isn't justifiable. We have to be very careful about that, he says. So it's this, th this isn't unanimous by any means. And so what happens in places like Saudi Arabia? Because we, we are dependent, evidently, on that oil. Russia, China, France, the rest of Europe. Remember what happened after the 1973 war when OPEC finally got their act together and jacked the oil, the bell price, you know, four to five times. States acted unilaterally. Japan paid the price. West Europe went to North Sea and paid the price. The United States went to North Slope and paid the price. Nobody really got together and said, well, what are we going to do about this oil? We all just paid the price. Well, you did. The Seven Sisters made out, didn't they? Because OPEC didn't challenge the profit margin. Very careful about that. And in, and in cartels, you have to be careful not to take the price too high. And of course, you have to have an inelastic good, a good for which there are very few substitutes. The banana cartel didn't make it. Countries tried to have a banana cartel, and it just doesn't work because you can substitute bananas. But oil works. Oil works. And the response then has been pretty unilateral. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Roger. Uh, yes, what, um, with the Saudis, if there's a vacuum in, in the control, um, wouldn't it be that the fundamentalists would then? Well, that's, that's that, that, and, and then and then the second part is: Would we then pay the price uh, in dealing with them to keep them in power so long as we can get what you we know, want? Juan, I was really hoping you were going to ask that question. He, he's, you know, you heard him. He said, "What what what happens if if and when the fundamentalists take over?" It's a really serious question. But I'm not sure that that's what the people want. If there's a power vacuum in Saudi Arabia, now remember that the Saudis follow. Um, what form of Islam? Uh, Wahhi, wa, uh, no, Wahhabi, Wahhabi, Wahhabi. And, and uh, the, the, the royal family has a very serious hold on things, don't they? They control information. They dish money when they have to. It is, it is absolutely the epitome of the rentier state. There's no public buy-in. Well, what happens if they're overthrown? What happens if there's, if there's uh, a, a power vacuum? Well, one of the conclusions that we draw from late international politics is that state building is not something that uh, strong states want to do. Several years ago, uh, Dixie's not here tonight, she might remember this, uh, at another World Affairs Council talk, I, I asked a question in about 1998, what would we do if we ousted the mustache? 
the mustache being Saddam Hussein, because we don't want a state build. Because if you take somebody out, you got to put somebody else back in. That's called state building. It's not nation building. They get it wrong, the, the media. It's state building. The nation's already there. Well, it's troublesome, isn't it? And aren't, and aren't we still in Iraq? We're still in Iraq. Yeah. And boy, that's a really tough question. Who's going to take over? Who has power? Who has the influence? I do not have that crystal ball. Great question. Great question. But you better, you better stay in contact with your decision makers. This is, this is important stuff. You want to stay up on it. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any specific reason you think that Saudi Arabia is going to fall in that? Are you just thinking that will take a domino effect, or are there signs that political signs are seen? She's asking us if we can predict behavior. <laughs> good, and, and I, I'm not laughing too much, but good scientists can predict behavior, can't they? That's, that's what scientists do. We call ourselves political scientists. Well, uh, members of our department at Aquinas College have often had this conversation about whether or not we should change our title from political science to the Department of Politics, because we're not that good. So is Saudi Arabia next? Did anybody see this coming, this, this whole Arab Spring thing coming? Not really. In 1992, I said, you're not going to beat the incumbent. How do, you, how do you beat a president, George Bush, that has a 90% or 80-some-percent approval rating? Well, Slick Willie came in and beat the incumbent. He got it done because maybe Bush didn't understand the economy. There's all kinds of reasons maybe he got it done. Is Saudi Arabia next? No, I would say Syria is in, in the next big trouble. Syria is in the next big trouble. The Economist had a really funny um, index that they used back when the Arab Spring was really going in February or March. They called it the Shoe Throwers Index. <laughs> Remember when Bush got the shoe thrown at them? And they tried to measure who's going to be next. And, of course, they weren't very accurate on that one. But the, yeah, there are ways that we try to measure this. And I think that, uh, for example, the professor at the US Army War College knows what she's doing. She's talking to people on the ground. Questions. How dissatisfied or how alienated are the Saudi public? How in tune is the government with what, with what they're saying? What, what, are, what is the public saying and how in tune is the government with that? Because they don't have to be unless the people start hitting the streets. And they're starting to hit the streets. Predicting what's, who's going to happen next is, uh, is a tough one, and I, maybe I'm not a good enough Middle East expert to, to answer that. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think Syria is in big trouble. Uh, you, you, yes, sir, right here in front. You haven't asked a question. I've got, I've got sort of a dumb question. Uh, everybody talks about the domino effect. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that at yep. all. I mean, these are separate countries. How does this, uh, this revolution spill from one country to the other? I just yeah, it's a really good question. It's not a dumb question. He asked, he said, uh, everybody calls this the domino effect. I'm not sure how that happens. These are separate sovereign states. Well, are they? I mean, yes, they are. But they're, they're also created. Those lines are drawn. And so what happens in Tunisia certainly does have an effect on their neighbors in Libya. And, and if, the, if the Egyptians can do it, then maybe the Libyans can do it. I mean, I, you know, I, that, that's a really good question. I have to say I, I haven't talked to enough Arabs that are out there revolting. It's a really good question. So how does one, how do the effects in one state affect the other? You know, the old theory in the State Department during the Cold War was that there was a domino effect. Find it. That really wasn't much of a domino there. But that it happened in Tunisia in a state that, you, you sir, are Tunisian, you're going to know a lot more about this than I will. How, how illegitimate was Ben Ali? Completely illegitimate. Yeah, pretty illegitimate, wasn't he? Yeah, th th what I'm going to say that there is so much common. It, they are completely different. They are states. Yeah. They have this revolution. But the one common thing is economy. Yeah. Economy is doing bad. Yeah. And ironically, during the revolution, I was spending my Christmas break in New York City with a Libyan friend. That's the uh, iron of the history. And we went back in Michigan on January the 10th. And what he told me on January the 14th, oh, man, you just make us look stupid. We need to have a revolution as well. <laughs> Your Libyan buddy said that. That's nice. my Libyan, that's my Libyan friend. This is what he said. And can I take this opportunity to ask you another quick question? Well, let's, let's finish the domino thing here okay, first. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure that it is the right term, but it's an easy one to use in the media. I think it's easily understood. It's easily understood, but, but whether it's really what's going on. So, I mean, obviously things have been brewing for a while, haven't they? This individual's frustration in Tunisia, that was serious, wasn't he? To, to, to kill yourself, to burn yourself. That's pretty motivated, isn't it? You have to be pretty serious to do that. Uh, so uh, there was a hand back here first that he hadn't asked. So let's, let's do that one first, and then we'll go. Yes, in his. yes sir. The Christian, Christian Arabs yes. supported the uh, Arab Spring. Yes. But now in many of these countries, the Islamists 
are now attacking the Christians. They're worried about it, aren't they? And killing them. Now, reciprocity of religious freedom was never um, valued, even with the dictators. But at least their lives were protected. But now, what's the prognosis for the Christians in these holy lands where Christians have been for 2,000 years? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, let me say that the Islamic Brotherhood didn't anticipate this either, did they? Or they'd have been behind it. Was this an Islamic movement? No, this is about economics and politics. And that's interesting. So you're, what you're really asking is not only about what's going to happen to the minority and uh, one of the fundamental items in our Federalist papers was this concept of protecting the minority from the tyranny of the majority. Now at the time the federal founders, and we could have conversations about whether I'm right about this or not, we were really talking about protecting the owning class against the majority non-owning class. But that concept has expanded to include itself about race and uh, ethnic groups and women and those disempowered ones. But protecting the ma minority against the tyranny of the majority is going to be pretty fundamental. And it's an important step in political development. I don't know enough to say what's going to happen on the ground in those factions across the board. But Western states have to keep a really important eye on this. Strong states have to keep a really important eye on this so that it doesn't bust into a war of religion. And maybe it already has in some places. Maybe it already has. But protecting the minority from the tyranny of the, of the majority is a really important concept. Yes, sir. Do you agree with this vision, with, with this formula, which is purely American, I guess? Any country in the world can be a democracy like the United States, and the United States can support them, but you cannot have nuclear powers. Second uh, comment that I want to add is, uh, concerning Tunisia, it, the revolution was not seriously at December 17. It started a couple of years ago in 2008. Right. And I'm thinking about writing a book about that to correct many of stuff. Yeah, these things aren't new, are they? Yeah. Yeah. If you look at, let me just give another example, another comparative example. Uh, Tiananmen Square didn't just happen in 1989. It happened in 1983. It happened a little bit in 1984. It happened again in 85 and 86. So these things aren't new. These things have been brewing. I'm not sure enough, I don't know enough about Libya to say it's been brewing, but for sure there's serious animosity between those in East Libya and what was going on in Tripoli. Serious animosity. What was the first part of your question? Do you agree with the vision that any country in the world can be a good democracy like the United States? Oh, yeah. Yes, well, the right to store nuclear power. Yeah. For example, Iran, for example. Yeah, there's two items. You're, you're, he, he asked, do I agree do, with the idea that any country can be a good democracy like the United States? Well, first, I'm not sure we're a good democracy. We're a decent republic. We're a decent republic. But you're not participating at very high rates. Well, you guys are because you're out here on Tuesday night to talk about this stuff. But less than 50% of you are participating, and, and therefore less, uh, about 25% of you are putting your president in, in, in office. So that says something about the legitimacy of the system. I, I think that, that Democrats and Republicans are both rather bankrupt. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that democratic principles based on certain cultures can't take hold. We're a European state. We, we're absolutely a European state. So then let's, let's say like Europe also. Uh, the other item that you just mentioned is, is what we call democratic peace theory. And that is that democracies, number one, are less likely to go to war, and number two, less likely to go to war with each other. So, so about nuclear weapons, this is important. It's okay for Israel to have nuclear weapons, we might argue, because they're a democracy. Turkey is a democracy. Turkey's a democracy? Prove it. Uh, they have elections. Israeli people are elected. Do they have multi-parties? Well, they're more democratic than others. I mean, we could have that conversation. Yeah, you might call Turkey a democracy. Hmm. On the scale of lots of democracy and not lots of democracy, I wonder. Yeah, Le Lebanon might be in the middle of the scale. But this question about whether or not democracies are not going to go to war or less likely to go to war and therefore it's okay for them to have nuclear weapons is a really important question. Or weapons of mass destruction. What about India and Pakistan? Why does Pakistan, I'll ask this question with a different example, why does Pakistan think they need nuclear weapons? Because India has them, and they can deliver them. It, and, and are nuclear weapons usable? No. Nuclear weapons are used for deterrence. It's a deterrent. It's, we used to call it mutually assured destruction, otherwise known as MAD. Mutually assured destruction. So nuclear weapons are usable as a deterrent. And, and in that sense, then, they, they can be used, can't they? Or they're usable. 
but they're not really usable. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I know and historically people like in Libya and other countries have had a lot of influence by socialist and left-wing militants like the RAF. Can you see them having a resurg resurgence here now? It's a good question. You know, when people are frustrated economically, uh, they certainly want a different distribution of wealth. And one can certainly argue that uh, capitalism in whatever form you might um, argue it's in uh, hasn't worked that well in some countries. Uh, what, what, what kind of a government, what kind of an economy is Saudi Arabia? It's a ki kingdom that owns all the wealth, that uses the market, that really doesn't use the market because it's not supply and demand. It's really just that we have the supply and you're going to demand it. Uh, do mar I don't know, do markets work in, in Saudi Arabia? It's a great question. So people are going to begin to question the economic system that they are, are entering into or coming out of. And uh, certainly, you know, mixed economies uh, are sort of what's going on now, aren't they? We, we, we guarantee education sometimes in this country. Imagine if education was allocated by the market. Then only us wealthy would have education, wouldn't it? Well, wait a minute, I work for the Dominicans. I'm not that wealthy. I'm working on it, though. Imagine that. So, so mixed economies are sort of a, a dynamic that we're dealing with, isn't it? So fundamental is the role of the state in the economy. That's really an important political science -y question. What role does the state play in the economy? And in these rentier states, they own and control it, don't they? The people, want, the people want something different. And people want to work. There's nothing wrong with work. And people just want to get paid a fair wage. That's, that's across the board. Is another hand over here? Juan? Going back to the domino effect, um, it's the cultural domino effect. And since those mm. European lines are straight lines, it cuts through uh, the, the inter intertwining of different cultures, uh, like their fingers being intertwined, that, uh, the line goes right between them. Yeah. So um, it, it is because of my brother uh, rebelling in this condition or situation, uh, that I can rebel uh, against my leader because my brother, the same culture, is doing it against his leader. Uh, great point, but I'm going to ask you then, how strong is Pan-Arabism? I don't know. I I'm not sure Pan-Arabism is really that strong. A lot of schisms. Well, I'm talking right next to each other. Yeah, right next to each other, yeah. All right. Although the... Tunisia and Egypt, but Egypt was ripe because Egypt has a constitution that, that says some things about civil rights and civil liberties. Egypt supposedly has elections. Egypt has a relatively, a much more democratic recent past than the rest of the Middle East. So, they, so that culture may have been certainly more ripe in Egypt. Yeah, great question, great, great comment. Yes, sir. Yeah, he, he said, uh, wouldn't autocratic leaders in these countries uh, be so worried about what's going to happen to them that they're going to make some serious change? And certainly that's, that's what Syria is trying to deal with. That's what uh, the royal family in Saudi Arabia is trying to do. They are, they are trying to make some of those changes. But are you going to give up power also? Are you just going to wholesale say, all right, I'm, I'm done. You know, we'll hang it up. We're no longer king and queen. That's not going to happen either. So we're talking about structural change. Structural change is really hard to do. Going from, for example, a monarchy to a republic. That's structural change. That's structural change. And that's tough to do. So, so that Libya, I'm sorry, that Tunisia had this democracy in its history might mean their future is a little better in terms of being able to respond to more legitimate public demands. And maybe we'll refer to our, our expert in the back. And the same, the same with Egypt. But I'm not sure about Libya. One of the arguments that we used to make, in, and Professor uh, Duncan, who does uh, Russian studies, might uh, correct me on this one, but one of the reasons why uh, we, we question what's going to happen in Russia is because they have a, practically no history of, of democratic processes. In fact, I've heard someone, someone ask, what was the difference between the Tsar and Stalin? <laughs> Stalin built some power plants, maybe dished out a little more food, but he killed a lot of people. 
And he had a, a cadre of people that, that had some money. So, so government, I'm sorry, nations, people that don't have histories of these sort of in, this involvement or democratic processes, this is a lot harder to get in their culture. It's a lot harder to get in their culture. But some of the experts are saying, hey, this is what they want. It's economic and political. Yeah, and I'm telling you, the, the Islamic brothers, the, they were behind the ball. They didn't see this one coming. And, but the religious factions in the Middle East, this, is, this could be serious. I, I, I'm sympathetic to your question. Yeah, one more question. Yes, sir. Oh, Professor Duncan. Do you think Gareth Spring could have an impact south of the Sahara in Africa? Sure could. Uh, as you work your way down, you know, Sudan, uh, this is really important. Su Sudan is now split. And uh, the government in South Sudan is certainly going to try to be more democratic. Um, Boy, Democratic Republic of Congo, that's going to be tough. As you work your way around, uh, you know, you've got uh, the Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone and Liberia, really tough places. Libya, um, you know, blood diamonds are very real. I'm not talking about the Hollywood movie. I'm talking about blood diamonds. Yeah, uh-huh. It's so easy to forget. Yeah. But, but what, one, of the, one of the reasons we do this, and, and if I had uh, my buddy uh, Rich McCluskey, the geographer in here, he could tell us more. Maybe some of you are trained geographers. That... There's a schism there, isn't there? And one of the reasons why Sudan had to split is because you had Arab Sudanese and black Sudanese. It was absolutely a multinational state. And those, those dynamics played themselves out. Of course, oil was a biggie because the, the Arabs that ran the Sudanese state wanted the oil that was down where the blacks lived. Now, what about Nigeria? Nigeria is a multinational state with oil. That one could be really problematic if you want to work your way all the way around. Yeah. I wonder if it's not going to go the other way, and I, I guess I wonder about Turkey. I really do wonder about Turkey. I'm not convinced they're that democratic. Yeah. Uh, Jordan's going to be important. Iraq, who knows what's going on in Iraq, and will it spill over into Iran? You know, Iran, uh, again, Iran has, has a, a short history of democracy. Their constitution came around in the early 1900s when the then Shah um, had to put up with some public demonstrations. said, all right, we'll have a constitution. And after World War II, then, uh, that that parliament asserted itself. And that's how Mozambique, no, Mozambique came into being, into, into place, into power. And then, of course, that was put down and the shock came back in. And now it's a theocracy. Good question. Thank you very much.